and welcome to Snacky Tunes. Uh, I am one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. And the other half your host, Darren Bresnitz. And we are so excited to be ending our virtual book tour with an absolute bang on event. We couldn't be more happy to be sitting around and just inviting on this New Orleans vibe on a Thursday night as the fall sets across America. Uh, we want to welcome all of uh, you to the event. If you have any questions for anyone involved, please email them at events at faden.com. We'll get to the end. Uh, and enough about me, because you're not here to see me talk. Guess I'll kick it over to you. Why don't you introduce who you are and say a little bit about yourself? Uh, ben, why don't we start with you? I am Ben Jaffe with the Preservation Hall Band in New Orleans. And I'm here in my studio downtown. And Greg, it is good to see you and hear your voice after all these months. It's excellent to see you. Thank you for your DJ sets earlier in COVID. We, uh, we appreciate it. Chef? Hi, everybody. My name is Chef Nina Compton. Um, I'm actually in my restaurant that looks like a tropical background or in the weeds, whatever you'd like. Um, but I'm chef owner of Compella Pen and by What American Bistro here in New Orleans, and I'm happy to be the last stop of this book tour. So thank you for having me. And I'll kick it over to Jackie. Hey guys, I'm uh, Jackie Blanchard. I'm a chef by trade, owner of Catelier in New Orleans uh, and in Nashville. Uh, we're here in the shop, uh, Catelier on Oak Street, uh, uptown in the River Bend in New Orleans. And I'm just thrilled to, to be here and to be part of such a cool crew of um, just, you know, unique voices um, with food and music. It just couldn't connect more. Very excited to be here. Yes, well, we're, we're so happy. And, you know, we're here to celebrate all of the amazing chefs uh, who were part of the book, Snacky Tunes, Music is the Main Ingredient, out on Fade In. And, you know, we focused on cities all over the world. And what we can found in all the research is that while some cities have really great food reputation. Some cities have great music reputation. Some cities have great art reputations. New Orleans, it has all of them. And if you've ever been lucky enough to spend time there, beyond just having reputations, there really is an incredible intersection. I can't really think of any other cities that exemplify that crossover between food, music, art, and how they inspire each other. And so I'd love for you to all talk a little bit about how uh, the food and the music and the art of the city inspire what you do, um, whether it's making knives, making music or making food. Chef, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, New, New Orleans is so enchanting. That's the word I like to use when, when I describe the city. When you walk down anywhere in the city, it's the, the vibe is there. The music is there. Um, the food is there. So, I mean, it, it just makes sense that those things are in, intertwined. Um, and historically, they are intertwined. Um, and it's, that's why people come to the city because of the music and the food. And I think that they really go hand in hand and we're truly blessed to have so many talented musicians and chefs in the city that are doing different things, different genres. And I, I, that's why I came here. That's why I moved here is because of those two things. So it's, it's in my veins. Ben? Oof, yeah, I think Nina said it right there. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's in the, um, it's, it's, it's in the core of, of the way this city interacts with itself, um, music and food, particularly in the, in the communities that I grew up in and, you know, in the, in certain neighborhoods, I mean, the sixth ward, the seventh ward, um, the Ninth Ward and you know tremendous areas. These these particular neighborhoods, where where I uh, had lots of friends, I you can you can you can feel this uh, this connection to this ancestral connection to another place and another time that has has been uh, somehow preserved and maintained in, in the soul of it is important because all of those things that, that you just said art music and food those those are all 
things that are, are, are bring people together in a communal, um, in a communal way. And that's really important to me. I, I don't know why else I would play music if it wasn't to bring people together onto the, the same stage and into the same room together and have a communal experience. And that's what you experience when you're feeding people and, and, and nourishing people, you feel that, that, this, that, that communal experience and same with, same with the art. I, when you said that, when I was thinking, I was like, is there, and does anybody create art to divide people or it's not, it's, it, people, if you are, well, I, I don't, I can't even begin to think that way because art is, is a, a way to communicate. It's a form of communication, so. People might, uh, I remember some artists during the Bush residency, second Bush, who made some stuff that may have divided some people and even during the Trump presidency, some art that's divided people, but. Uh, what? It, I didn't say, I didn't say create art that, that won't piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, good art does usually do that, you know? Yes. But uh, yes, it always, it always includes a discourse, even if it might be opposing sides. How about that? Yeah. And Jackie, for you, what, where yeah. do you see how the, the two are intertwined in, in the city? I just feel like, you know, like everybody touched on, it's part of our DNA. It's part of our fabric here. I feel like the city sort of chooses uh, it picks and chooses its people who who it wants to be here. Um, New Orleans has like this intangible nature about it um, that really draws you in in such a dynamic way. And I think the absolute common denominator of that is the way that music and food um, have affected all of us so deeply, you know, just touching on the heels of, you know, our Katrina 15 years ago, um, I remember I remember very specifically that uh, Halloween right after the storm and when the city kind of reopened, um, we were all on Frenchman Street and people were just hugging and crying on each other. The first time they'd seen each other, first time we had been out since then and what a connection the music scene was on Frenchman that night to bring us back home. Um, and it's a way, it's, it's hard to describe. Um, what it meant for those restaurants to come back and to, to be open and how important that some of these restaurants are to us. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's so dynamic and it's, um, it's so at the core of our being in this town and you cannot leave it. It touches you in some way every day. Um, you know, I'm on Oak street right down from, you know, the Maple Leaf where we get a chance to see, you know, these amazing world-class musicians on, you know, you know, before COVID times on a regular Tuesday night. Um, and, and some of us kind of take that for granted sometimes because it's not so readily available in other cities. And I think this city is what's, it's, it's connection to the music and the food and, and it's emotion is so engaging. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes indescribable. I, you know, I, I, uh, how important live music is and how much we miss it right now is just, um, it's something that, I didn't think would affect me so deeply um, until I, uh, down the street from my house uptown, um, several folks would sort of hire out a brass band to play in their front yards. And so the neighborhood would sort of come out and, and watch this brass band play in a driveway so we could socially distance um, so that we could have some live music. And I swear to God, I burst into tears so many times because it just hit me like a train, you know, like you don't expect, um, to, it to hit you that fast and that and that emotionally um, when you realize what live music does for you, it, what the food that we we're missing. We, you know, we're watching uh, some of our our best friends lose their restaurants right now, and and how that affects us because that food scene and that music scene is is the most important thing we have, and it what draws us all together. Um, and it's just like this intangible nature to it um, that's just. It's hard to describe. It's just a, a very emotional sort of effect on all of us. One of the things that New Orleans, I think as Darren touched on, does so uniquely is that food and music um, are beacons of hope in the, in the most difficult times. Um, I think as you touched on Katrina, but even through this hurricane season about, um, or even just getting through COVID. And Ben, I'd love to start with you about the role in which you see music um, 
in New Orleans, but in, in general, as getting people through difficult times and, and how it can help people find joy in even the most difficult situations. And, and Nina, I would have the same question to you, but replace music with, with food. In the African-American community of New Orleans, for over a hundred years, it's the ultimate sign of respect and honor to have a band accompany your funeral procession. And part of that is to play music that helps people to mourn this loss. That's, um, that's a powerful, 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 powerful um, a moment, you know, to see a, an entire community mourning together and the music being, being the vehicle, you know, and then to see the moment that the body is, is laid to rest and the mourners uh, exit the cemetery and once everybody's come out onto the street again from the cemetery, the band begins to play happier, more joyful songs. And you can feel the sadness come off of people. You, you, can, you can physically see it happening. And what was once sorrow is now joy and happiness. And it's the, the, the music that is helping people deal with this, you know, unbearable feeling of loss. Um, that's, that's how music, that's how powerful music is in New Orleans. It's used at our saddest, saddest moment. It's used to help us through our saddest moments in life. Um, I know for me and my fellow musicians, we've uh, we've missed the inter the human interaction because that's the the environment that we grew up in, where you're you can actually see people physically uh, responding to the music you're playing, and we've had to uh, really go inside of ourselves and sort of become monk-like in our daily routine to help us get through this, uh, you know, this period where we're not able to perform live because that, that is why we play music in New Orleans and why, why I should say why the musicians I grew up with play music is it, it was this live experience, you know, uh, the oldest member of our band doesn't, you know, he, he vaguely knows what the internet is. He hears people talking about it all the time, you know, but he's 88 years old. So to him, it's, it's, it's live music. It's live music. So we we're creating that here in this space and at preservation hall where the us band members are, are still able to get together and, uh, and, uh, and, and do music really for us and, um, but I, I, I don't know that, that, um, I, I, I imagine it's the same for, 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 you know, people in, in, uh, in, 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 in the world of food is that is you're cooking, you, you have, if you can't cook for somebody, I can't even imagine it's like not playing music. It's, it's, you're not, you're, you're, you're kind of not being, being able to quite access that thing that you, you feel like you've been put on earth to do. You know, so we've been um, we've been enjoying these moments where we get to connect with, with everybody uh, because uh, this reminds us of why we just, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep your heads up. Mm. <laughs> Chef? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Ben really captured the same thing that happens in the in the food industry now is that you know, back in March when we were told to shut down, I didn't know what to do. 
you know, I had to pause for a, a quick second and really wrap my head around it. But that was kind of my motivation through this all was hoping to come back to the kitchen cooking for people. Um, you know, because again, you can, I can make the best dish, but if I have nobody to serve it to, what's the point? And I think that, you know, during this time, a lot of people are, they're mourning, they're mourning uh, human interaction, they're, they're mourning um, normalcy, they're missing their families. Um, you know, my mom lives back in, in the Caribbean, and I miss her more than ever and you know I, I feel like I'm 12 years old because I call I'm like mom I really miss you you know because she she just seems so far away so when it comes to food I think we're all looking for comfort and that's one of the things when I opened my restaurants I, I basically restructured the menu to to have those comforts those comforting dishes that people just feel like it's a warm hug in a bowl you know, when they're having the curry goat, because it's, it's just, it's just comfort and it's, it's satisfaction when you have something that's really tasty and it hits your soul. And I think that's what people want nowadays. They really want to be taken care of, you know, given, just given, shown some love. I think, you know, either through food or music, I think for me, you know, really good food makes me really happy. And so does really good music. It sets, it sets the tone. I said it in the book. I said in the book that the first thing I do is I put music on when I wake up because it sets the tone for my day. It puts me in a really good mood. Um, and I think that just becomes this uh, transfer of energy through your day, through music. And then that transfers to me and I create food and that transfers to somebody else. So I think it's just a pass on of, of positive energy. And I think that's what we really need now because um, I think a lot of people are very lonely. You know, I, I think it's, it's a lot to deal with. And I think that we're nine months into this and we never thought that we would be, you know, nine months into this. And I think that it just, it's a, it's a dark road, but I think the sense of community in New Orleans is like no other. I think that people here, they check in on each other. Hey, how are you doing? You're okay? You know, I had friends that came to the pop-up yesterday. Like, hey, I just came to support you. And I think that's what keeps this city going is because we all support each other. Nobody wants to see anybody fail. And I think that that I was shown during Katrina and, and now we're seeing this during the pandemic that we all wanna see not just our friends, but the entire city succeed and not fall behind. Yeah, you know, um, it's all beautiful stories. Uh, I was actually in New Orleans for work the first Easter after Katrina and I had was, uh, I mean, I'll never forget, I had uh, Leah Chase's gumbo as herbs which was incredible to see the response of her doors being back open to have this you know dish that really only comes around once a year and to have it that first dish after Katrina and to see the outpouring of to people is something that has always stuck with me and inspired me and just thought about like how that one moment that one dish can inspire years on and years on and stays with you and I think that's really the big beauty of food and music especially when you look for it outside of what you work on so you know Jackie and, and, and Nina, you work in, in food and you look to music for inspiration and Ben, you look um, to food for your own inspiration to your creative process. So I'd love for you to each share maybe a story or, or a moment, uh, Jackie and Nina with music and Ben with food that inspired you in your own work or some moment like that. Um, Jackie, we'll start with you. What was a, a, a music moment that inspired some of the work and some of your creative process? Um, I feel like I've just been such a huge music fan my whole life. I started playing drums uh, and guitar when I was young uh, through both my parents were huge music fans. So music has always been such an important part of my life. Um, I think hearing some of uh, Dr. John's albums on Sunday mornings at my dad's house cooking breakfast, you know, was such a vibe. And I think a lot of my career built off of that. I, you know, went through culinary school um, in a very unknown part of South Louisiana that, um, you know, has a lot of connection to the land, has a lot of history. Um, but I think that when I started to realize how important musical notes and tone and being in the right key was that translated directly into cooking, that's what kind of lit me on fire. 
because I realized it had such of this dynamic connection of, you know, think of a, a Southeast Asian pantry and you've got all these amazing condiments. How do you balance that properly? It's the same when you're writing a song, uh, when you're composing uh, with notes. Um, I, I think that caught on to me very early. Um, and I think that has carried through, you know, just like Nina said, when, you know, music's the first thing she puts on in the morning because it sets the tone. Um, I think the same thing was true in a kitchen. Um, in a lot of the kitchens I ran, I would put music on during our prep sessions because it gave the kitchen a little bit more of a, you know, not an unfocused vibe, but it, you know, it gave you a little background and it, it, it inspired the day. Um, and it, and it kind of set a tone. Um, and I just think that's some of the most important parts of the relationship between music and food are those notes and those harmonies. Um, you know, and then the resiliency of the city, um, you know, over the course of, you know, all that we've sort of been through over the last, um, decade and, or more, um, you know, those, same notes, those same harmonies come alive and they play, um, you know, they play a tone to how we live our lives here. Um, they, you know, directly impact our everyday lives. Um, so I just think, you know, doc, particularly Dr. John, uh, we actually share a birthday and um, he was a huge influence earlier. I mean, his music was a huge influence early in my life in a weird connection to cooking at my dad's house. And that sort of like, you know, made me sort of wake up and realize what that connection was with music and food. Nina? So my connection through food and music is when I was, I think, 19 years old, I moved to Jamaica to work um, as a chef apprentice. And I remember the first day that I touched down in Jamaica and I started working and people were showing me around and they're so proud of their music and their food. And I remember just really being thrown into reggae music. And that for me was just, I never looked back. I, I would always loved it. And for me putting reggae on, it kind of just takes me back to Jamaica where it's, you know, it, 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 it just seems like every Caribbean person, maybe I'm biased because I'm from there they just don't seem like they have a worry in the world. So when I put it on, whether it's Steel Pulse, whether it's Bob Marley, it's just like, it's gonna be all right, you know, everything's gonna be fine. And it kind of just puts me in this, this mindset of things will work itself out. And that was, you know, a really special time for me because living in Jamaica, I really fell in love with the food and just understanding how different the Caribbean was and then with that connection of the music, it, it's just still like, kind of like my backbone right there. And to you, how has food sparked the creative process um, for your music making? Food is everything to us. Uh, I, can't, I, can't really think, I can't really think of music without thinking of food. I don't know if that's unique or not. I mean, I, I don't think it's that unique because we've, we've met people down in Brazil and when we went to Cuba and to Haiti and Colombia and Mexico, it's like, it, it's, it's just as important there as it is, or central to each other as it is here in New Orleans. You know, um, I, love, I love to cook and I grew up around a community of people who uh, always had something cooking on the stove, you know, so there was always food cooking. It was uh, almost like just one long meal. My whole childhood, I guess, kind of feels like just a really long, beautiful meal. But that's, uh, you know, my dad's friends also were musicians and restaurateurs and chefs uh, that, and one of the places where uh, that really intersected the most in New Orleans in my childhood was this place called Buster's in the French Quarter on the corner of Orleans and uh, Burgundy about a block from Congo Square. And that was where 
uh, it was kind of hard to tell the difference between who was the musician and who was the chef, you know, cause they all, they all like, you know, could have, they, the, 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 the energy and the personality, the like, overlapped, you know, between the two. I, and I always just saw that I always felt the two as being like hand in hand with one another, you know? Um, and I always cook, I cook every day uh, for my band. Uh, it's part of our ritual, you know? And um, what do you cook? I, yeah, what do that? you cook? What do you yeah, what cook? Do you, yeah. What's what your do specialty? I uh, well, we always have a pot of beans on. There's always a pot of beans cooking. So today it was kidney beans. It was red beans today. We've had this for a couple of days now, the same pot. We just keep adding water. <laughs> <laughs> Good flavor, right? Build yeah, up. Just, yeah. They say if, if you're from New Orleans, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you oh, can make yeah. a <laughs> for for like a week if you need to, man. Oh, um, yeah. I uh, I've I'm I'm a I'll confess that I cook my beans with a pressure cooker, and I know. Um, some people argue about that, but I'll tell you, it's um, it's one way you can wake up in the morning and be like, I want a pot of beans today. And you know, by lunch, you're going to have a pot of beans. Otherwise, that's like a seven to eight hour, nine hour waiting period from the time you decide you want beans, unless you have figured out a way to cook them faster. So um, I cook beans, uh, you know, I try to cook on the healthier side for my guys because they all have different issues health issues. So we've been eating a lot of Peruvian rice. I don't know if you all are familiar with Peruvian rice. No. Uh, rice. Uh, otherwise known as quinoa. <laughs> mm. Very healthy. What, what I discovered is not one of the guys in my band would eat quinoa, but they love Peruvian rice. <laughs> I hope they're not watching. I hope he didn't just spill the beans. <laughs> Your old daughter, whatever works on her, works on them. <laughs> wow. Also, Ben, I think the pressure cooker is the most underrated tool in the entire kitchen. So it I'm here for that 100%. <laughs> uh, one, we, we're, we're getting some questions in. If you have some questions, please send to events at faden.com. Uh, one of the questions that I, I think we want to give some worthy time to, um, we're obviously entering a, a second lockdown. Uh, cases are on the rise. Uh, one of the audience members asked, um, and uh, I, I one aside is our, our father is a former state epi epidemiologist who's been roped back into doing public health. Not roped back in, but gladly has. He, he went willingly, and we're so happy he's on the front lines. He's yeah. our source. Everyone says they got a, a uncle in the Pentagon. We got a dad in the New Jersey State Epidemiology <laughs> Office. So he has you know. been, he's been reviewing different um, vaccine protocols. And he called me this week and he said, uh, Louisiana has got their act together. Uh, oh, yeah, agree. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Based on the fact that you, you know, you've been through so many crises. So the question from the audience is, what does the world have to learn from New Orleans in times of crisis? Mm-hmm. Resiliency, um, number yeah. one. Start with you. Jeff. Oh, with me, I'm sorry. I thought it was Jackie. Uh, I think, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think the, the biggest thing, like Jackie says, was resiliency. I think um, you know, Louisiana has been through so much. Uh, hurricanes, um, you name it. Um, and this year alone, we had seven scares and the last one was actually the biggest one that really kind of got us but I think all in all it's the sense of community that really keeps keeps us going and I think people here are are responsible um, because they want to get back to normalcy I think the mayor's done a really good job in terms of clamping things down um, you know I think a lot of people are being think that she might be a little bit too strict but I think in these cases we have to be strict um, right. This is such a virus that is so deadly and so contagious. And we're seeing so many places spike and shut down. And, you know, it's the sense of, we need to be responsible. We need to be careful. Um, 
and and protect our city and make people want to come back here because you know without music or food or anything else and arts you know people will not come back and that's why we need to get back on track as soon as possible and that has to come down with being organized caretakers of of the city i couldn't agree more nina i think that she's done a, she's made the hard decisions that are extremely difficult to make and and for our betterment because um, just like you guys said, we are on the right side of this and, and we have been for a while. Um, you know, it's, it's yeah, a lot of times New Orleans, New Orleanians have to laugh to keep from crying. Um, and that's, I think our, our resiliency comes out of that. We are always used to being, um, given sort of the short end of the stick a lot of times, whether it's natural disasters or, or you know, any of this kind of stuff that we're going through. And I think that we have been so used to it and we will not live our lives here without some sense of community and the importance behind everyone bringing the right mentality to that. Um, and I think that com comes back with, you know, the responsibility of the community taking care of each other, just like you said, Nina, um, and, and how important, especially right now during, you know, this crisis, um, be having each other's back um, and, and finding a way out of it. Um, and and the, the pivoting of businesses that, you know, certainly we've had to do because our entire business is built on you coming here into the shop, holding a tangible, you know, tool. Um, how important is that tool to an everyday chef's life? It's a representation of their work. So how do we create, a, you know, that same experience without having that, you know, face-to-face -face sort of interaction. It's difficult to do. Um, so I think a lot of, you know, circling back to what makes New Orleans so special with that is our resiliency to just adapt and overcome uh, no matter what's thrown at us. Yeah, I mean, that sense of community is really something that I think about all the time when I think about New Orleans. You just feel that. Um, what have you seen or specific stories or anything that you have done, I know you talked about, you know, brass bands in driveways, but being those institutions, having such, you know, the means to support or needing support, uh, Ben, we'll go to you. What support of the community have you seen? What have you done? What is inspired by you? And, you know, obviously the balance is that some people don't have the means to support and things like that. So how can you feel that you're giving back to the community if you may not have the means or even the mental space to do so? That's a, a great, a great question that, you know, many of us ask ourselves often, you know, and, and really, uh, I, I believe speaks to a quality that, that is here in New Orleans and that people are attracted to. It's, um, it's a, immediately when, when, when put in the face of a, of a tragedy, it's, it's, it's not, how do I save my own ass? It's how do I save everybody? You know, that's kind of the, uh, the feeling I get from, from having lived here, you know, being from here is uh, this, you know, gratefulness, this uh, appreciation. I, I, I even, tell people who are considering moving here or, or are, are here, living here, but doubting why they live here. I, I tell them that, you know, that there's a huge responsibility that comes with living in New Orleans. And it's almost like a tap, you know, and it's, you never know when it's gonna hit you. You don't know what it, <laughs> form it's gonna take, but there's a responsibility and a cost for living here yep. and part as being uh, a member of a community, a responsible member of a community, you know, and that's something I take very seriously. I take that to heart. And what we've done at Preservation Hall is very quickly turned our attention to the most important resource and the thing that needed our attention the most. And that was this community of musicians who generation after generation continue a musical tradition 
that is celebrated at Preservation Hall. We wanted to honor those musicians uh, and immediately began uh, a COVID relief fund for those musicians so that the musicians who play at Preservation Hall and um, as of last week, we have over 20 musicians, elder statesmen in our legacy program that are 65 and older and about uh, 35 musicians in the greater Preservation Hall community that all receive um, support through our foundation uh, every month. And that's been a lifeblood for them. And we've been out right, just pounding, 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 uh, finding ways to uh, raise awareness and funds for this, uh, for this cause. And uh, man, it's been um, a blessing. It's helped us reconnect or connect for the first time with many of our supporters that aren't only just here in New Orleans, you know? Some of the biggest supporters of New Orleans aren't even from here or don't even live here, but they come here every year for Jazz Fest or, uh, you know, they went to Tulane or they worked here or they married somebody from here or they came here one night and said, oh my God, I could live here the rest of my life. You know, and then a week later, they're signing, you know, a lease somewhere, you know, in an apartment in the Garden District. Um, it happens every day, you know. So, did I did I answer anything? I don't know what I just said. That uh, I did not. My wife and I are are uh, can you know in the process of we just moved to Louisiana and we we're, we're thinking about where to land. And I now know the response. I did not know there was a responsibility that came with New Orleans. Mm. Uh, good to know that it comes with uh, I wouldn't say a price but it it's comes a tax with, he's absolutely right it comes in various forms and you don't know when it's going to hit but there's always a tax Jackie I think that you might be in a unique position outside of um, Chef and Ben because it's almost like buying gold in a depression right like you know when things like live music and eating out go sure. down when cooking goes up so I'd be curious to see, it's like, you know, what trends have you seen or what have you seen that's changed um, in the city that is, you know, so self-identified with live music and, and good food and how is either consumer habits or, or how have people still kind of kept the New Orleans spirit alive while still uh, adapting to COVID times as, as a shop, as a beautiful, by the way, allow me to say aside, your shop is stunning. What you have done is incredibly difficult. I walked in there and like, while well, we were talking, I was like, this is impossible what you've done. You've treated your <laughs> knife shop like a natural wine buying. Uh, it's incredible. <laughs> I highly recommend anyone to check it out or order a line. But like, what have you seen as, as changes um, that still reflects the, reflects the New Orleans spirit? So I think um, right off the bat, when, you know, we were kind of figuring out how to pivot into, um, an online world when everything was shut down, when this is such a tangible experience here, um, we were raffling off um, some knives to support community, uh, New Orleans community fridges, um, food banks around town, things like that, um, in efforts to be able to, you know, give back in that respect. And it's, in another respect, it's as, sometimes as simple as, um, supporting your friends who are having these pop-ups who are just doing it to get by because that's their only income. It's the same thing with supporting a lot of these musicians virtually and, you know, the, the tip jars and things like that. So while, you know, the trend has been, we've seen a lot more people cooking at home um, because, you know, maybe they, you know, wanted to work on that skill set, and maybe they just never had the time, or that maybe they're teaching their kids now how to cook, which I think is a, a skill set. It's a life skill set. Um, so, you know, we've noticed these trends of, you know, folks paying more attention to what they're cooking at home and the tools they're using. Um, and and I feel like everyone's trying to make their homes a little bit more comfortable these days, um, because you know, there's not much else to do, and we're kind of we're kind of locked in it. But um, you know, you saw a lot of people making bread and you saw um, a lot of make people making pasta. These things are really therapeutic. Um, and I think that's, you know, we sort of 
made sure that we focused on making certain things like that available. Maybe, maybe it's a great uh, baking book with, uh, you know, the proofing basket and, you know, kind of creating these little sets for people to be able to use at home um, during that time, you know, when they, they have this time to cook and they have this time, you know, we really got into more cookbooks because we realized that was a time, you know, for people to, to get into something more than what they were used to cooking. You know, I feel like we all kind of get into a rut at home sometimes of like kind of cooking some of the same stuff over and over. And I think um, this kind of gave people an opportunity um, to really sort of broaden that horizon and, and get into things maybe they wouldn't have normally gotten into cooking. Um, so it, I feel like we've kind of been helping navigate people to certain, you know, genres of cooking, certain countries, um, certain things like that, um, and then making sure they have the right tools for that at home. Um, and it's bringing people joy. You really see, and I think that's something I didn't really anticipate was like the joy that some of these tools bring people while they're cooking at home. It kind of make it makes you forget for a second that all this is like happening in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, something as simple as that is really powerful in a way. Um, and then, you know, making sure like, you know, there's that side of the coin, but the other side of the coin is like, you want to support your friends, restaurants who are doing to go and you want to support your friends pop-ups who are trying to get by. So like, there's a level of, you know, you want to cook at home now because you're there, but you also want to, you know, support your buddies um, because the food scene here is so prolific and so important to us that if, you know, that goes, like Nina said earlier, you know, if that goes with the music, you know, what do we have here? Um, it's just so part of our core. Um, so I just feel, you know, I think overall folks are trying to comfort themselves at home. And I think a lot of that um, is, is found through food um, and it's found through the tools they're using um, and I think it's pretty impactful. And, you know, I think that we have focused wholeheartedly on making sure like we're available, you know, for consultations and things like that. If, you know, um, people have, you know, questions about what tool to use for this or which knife to use for this. And you can tell people getting into it a whole lot more um, than I felt um, most had ever had, you know, and we're not just a sh shop for chefs, you know, home cooks are such an important part of our, um, our community and of our business. Um, and I think like, for some reason, it's just been, um, you find these weird silver linings in, in throughout all of this. And I think that, um, us being available to sort of impart, you know, a different cookbook on somebody or, or the right tool is like something that seemingly is very small, but very impactful, I think in the end. Um, chef, uh, one of the special parts of this book is we got to make a t-shirt with you. Yes. Uh, we uh, partnered with our friends, Everybody World, um, and it was designed and creative directed by our friends, Terrence Te and Naomi Abel, uh, that just made this really beautiful shirt that was inspired by your childhood luncheons. Um, it's actually, yeah. uh, hand, Naomi was inspired by your menu and, and drew um, essentially drew what you used to eat as ch in your childhood. You talk about in the book uh, about how lunchtime was key in your family, that it was very, you could, other things were maybe negotiable, but lunch was always, yeah. you know, you had to be there. Um, and you talk, and you talk about how your mom loved music and would play music along the same time. So, um, and, and Ben, of course, you come from a very, very musical family. And I believe I see in both of you second generation music lovers, um, both inspired deeply by your parents. So I'd be curious if you could both touch on briefly what was on your parents' playlist growing up? What are the sounds that if you were to hear it uh, would immediately make you think of your parents? And Chef, we'll start with you and then we'll go, we'll go to Ben because I feel like Ben, you might need a little bit more time to get this answer. So, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so my mom, she's a romantic. So listening to ABBA, she loved Julio Iglesias and she'd always sing his songs in Spanish and, you know, dance around the house. She loved Diana Ross. So she, my mom has a beautiful voice and just her just being around the kitchen or being at the house. And we always had that music on, especially on the Sunday, because Sunday was considered like the day of rest. So it was a big family day where we'd be cooking and eating, but it was always definitely music surrounded. So that is, if I listen to any Diana Ross or Abba song or Julio Iglesias, my mom comes to mind. Uh, 
Oh, wow. Um, well, I grew up at Preservation Hall. It was pretty much our living room. So we didn't listen to, we didn't have um, access to uh, popular music. Everything we heard was New Orleans music. Um, I didn't hear popular music until I was kind of older, uh, until I was maybe eight or nine years old. Uh, we had a, a radio and we could hear some of the local pop stations, but I'm always reminded of, I mean, the there's a certain, um, a uh, certain New Orleans um, sound like timbre in the music that when I hear that that timbre, it, 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 it's resembles a human voice. It, it's some people, you know, make they call it brassy or uh, when uh, a musician creates certain inflections on the instrument. Um, that's something that that always reminds me of of my of my parents, particularly my father, uh, who would you know take me with him on his uh, brass band um, performances. So I I always associated uh, music with these like New Orleans music with these big emotional moments. Um, in my life, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know pop music. I didn't know Bruce Spring. I didn't know, man, we never even know, we didn't know who Bruce Springsteen was. I mean, they didn't play his music down here. It was hard to hear anything else, but like what was going on down in New Orleans, like the Neville brothers, uh, the meters, Alan Toussaint, Irma Thomas, Lee Dorsey. You kind of had to, yeah, that was what we were just listening to kind of what they, everything they play on WWOZ today. You know, that was like what was popular down here. You know, uh, that was our top 40 music. Um, yep. It, it, by the way, speaking of New Orleans sound, I know Darren's up next, but uh, I just got turned on to 79ers gang. Uh, and yeah. I was playing it for my wife in the car and within 30 seconds, she's like, is this band from New Orleans? Like there's just, it's like, there's just this sound. It's like when Beyonce did Homecoming, it's like there's only one place where that, there's just only one place where that sound right. comes from. Um, anyway, I, I digress, Darren. Yes. So we have, we have a question uh, from some of the people watching right now. And if you have more questions, please email us at events at faden.com. Um, you know, during these days uh, with the quarantine and things like that, people are looking for music and food inspiration. So what have you been listening to and what have you been eating during quarantine? And uh, Jackie, we'll start with you. I have been listening to a lot of meters. Um, the meters brings me a kind of joy that I can't describe. Um, just getting into you know, more meter. I, I, that was one of my biggest influences growing up. I used to go to jazz fest, you know, at a very early age with my dad every year. Um, and you know, that kind of music was introduced to me earlier. Um, actually getting more into new, just more new Orleans, old Alan Toussaint. Um, a lot of, uh, Dr. John, just a he, you know, huge fan of that. Uh, actually a lot of radio head, <laughs> I'm a big Radiohead fan. I feel like it's got it's got the right mood and uh, tone for you know sort of what's going on right now. Um, it's Mazzy Star. Uh, mm. I've been kind of really build on a record collection um, throughout all this because I feel like music is absolute therapy right now. Um, I, I I talk about it all the time um, with like family members, um, and I think putting an investment into a, you know, a little bit of the vinyl collection right now is is what's getting a lot of people through, you know, uh, or just music in general um, and building on that um, because music is therapy, just like food is therapy. Um, I've been eating a lot more plant-based food just because I want to keep my immunity up. 
I think that's uh, just something I've focused on a lot more than I've ever have. Um, cooking at home a lot more, obviously. Um, eating out a lot less. Um, so just trying to focus on, you know, a lot of green, especially heading into the fall, a lot of greens, uh, a lot of gumbo, gumbo. I've been cooking a lot of gumbo. Uh, my freezer is full of gumbo in various forms. Uh, okra gumbo, a dark roux seafood gumbo, uh, a chicken and sausage, everything you can imagine. Um, I think these processes are very comforting. The process of making gumbo to me feels different right now than it ever has in a way. Um, it gives me the, like this therapy, just like when I've got my record playing on in the background. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the cooking at home with, um, with that background and that, you know, whatever you're into musically right now, um, is definitely like one of those therapeutic things you can do for yourself. Ben, what are you cooking? What are you listening to? Oh, wow. So... Cook um, sort of what I think are like are things that'll be tasty for my band, like I was saying, and um, but also on the uh, you know like the healthier side. So I try to um, I love to eat. So let's see, what did we have today? We did like chicken thigh seasoned chicken thighs i cook with cast iron and uh some beans i threw like a handful of mushrooms in there light seasoning uh try to use you know just olive oil and like coconut oil no and just you know not a lot of meat not a lot of fatty meats but that's um i've seen like uh how uh, a heavy meal can put a band to sleep really quick uh, and I've been at sessions before where that's happened. So I've learned not to do like real heavy cooking for them, you know, um, to get the best out of them. I mean, music, ah, gosh, you know, I'll tell you, it's, uh, the internet's been, it's such an amazing tool to discover new music, even new old music. And uh, I, I, have, I haven't done it recently because I've been working on some original work, but uh, I can easily get into like a rabbit hole. You know, I can just type in a city uh, in West Africa. You know, I could just type in like Kinshasa and just go, you know, and three days later, you know, come up for air. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I go. Um, it's not, I'm not always like, just need to hear what I know but I'm always trying to like find the source of things and just find this like connective vibration through music where it's all connected. Um, and uh, yeah, I listen to quite a bit of vinyl cause I have my parents collection. So I listen to a lot of that. I have my own vinyl collection and and then the other half of the time we're playing our own music. So that's, a, I find a lot of inspiration in that as well. But um, I find a lot of inspiration and a purpose in life by playing music and feeding, being able to cook for others. That's a, feels like a purpose, you know. Chef? Yeah. Well, I've been um, on my days off, we've been either grilling a lot or we just got a little pizza oven. So we're having pizza night um, and it's just fun. You know, I'm teaching my husband how to actually make pasta and become a grill master now. So we're, we're just doing simple things like, you know, grilled pompano and just some grilled vegetables, like really light, simple. Um, and I kind of go through phases where I want to eat, you know, healthy plant-based things. And then there's some days where I'm like, listen, this is a global pandemic. I'm going to treat <laughs> myself today. <laughs> so I can like go through some back and forth where it's like, I have a good week where I'm eating really healthy. And there's some weeks like, I'm like, no, this is, I can't, I can't deprive myself of, of some, some goodness. So I think that is a thing that I, I want to tell people is that, you know, if you need the comfort, get it. 
take it um, because you know it, it is a very hard time for everybody right now. And if you can find that little glimmer of hope through music and, and food, you know, my husband and I we just put, you know, just like very chill music when we're grilling in the in the in the garden. We put on things like blood orange or Santa Gold. It's just kind of like this very chill vibe in in the in the garden. And that's what I kind of want to have when I'm at home with a glass of wine, just escaping everything that's going on not looking at the news but just really focusing on simple things you know like making a really good pizza and eating it you know like in 30 seconds that's what i'm really enjoying now mm. uh jackie i want to say that radiohead also got me through the pandemic uh <laughs> youtube served me up um all of their like live footage and I just kept going so i would watch songs that were performed 20 years ago and then watch them yeah. perform in 2020 and see how specifically Tom's voice changed from early right. days. I would just like, I would time travel with Radiohead and on my worst days in the pandemic, it really got me through of just like, all right, I want to see like the 1998 version of right. Talk to the Host. So now I want to see the 2018 version of it. And I just went back and forth and, and Ben. It's such an arc. I, I completely agree. Uh, and I, I couldn't, describe that better than you just did it's it's so true you're deep diving old stuff to see how that has changed and um that i don't know that music is so impactful um and it's gotten me like from start to finish through what's your favorite album it's not albums it's songs i'm okay. like the way that i listen to music is is in songs and, and speaking of that ben if you ever pick up your or when you pick up your instagram show again and it's just cut some of the jaffe parent collection i will be there well, along with everyone, if you're just playing your parents, Jaffe's parents vinyl has its own radio show written all over it. Oh yeah, um, I like so we that. Have, I I think there's something there, like just knowing it's from their collection. There's such like a rich history to that, and also having that creative constraint that it's only pulled from there. What they I bought, like I would definitely listen to that. I'm up for the job doing it. I like the idea. Yeah. So we have one more question for you, but uh, I'm going to allow everyone to tag out and then we're going to end. Uh, Darren's going to take us out, but um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to Faden so much um, for helping us get this book out. Thank you to everyone that showed up on this tour. It's been amazing. Thank you to all our participants. Thank you to everyone who bought a book tonight. Um, proceeds from sales go to Son of a Saint uh, and the Preservation Hall Fund, um, two incredible charities picked by our musical and chef guests. Um, we'd love for everyone um, within their last question to kind of say where people can find them, Instagram, website, wherever, but Darren's going to tag us out. And I just want to say thank you to my partner, Darren, and to Kong, who's not on here. Thank you for helping uh, write a beautiful book and to all the chefs who participated. It is truly beyond our wildest dreams. And a big thank you to Omnivore, who made these words come to, to visual life. Um, thank you. It's been, it's been great. So Darren, why don't you take us out with yeah. your last question? So thank you to you and to Kong and Snacky Tunes are for everything. Chef, uh, for the book, for the podcast, for the t-shirts, everything. Uh, yes, thank you everyone and Kong and Greg and Fade and everyone who's watching. You know, we finished this book in March. Uh, we didn't know that this would be capturing a time capsule of independent restaurants and this, this vibe of just what it meant to go out and to be out and listen to music and find a great meal and music in any city in the world. And while we are probably entering another really dark phase, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And so with your last statement and saying where people can follow you and, and then learn more about what you're up to and things like that, I'd love for you to say the really looking forward to when this is all done and when we're out of our houses and the pandemic is wrapped and everyone's safe and we have a vaccine, what are you looking forward to? Chef, we'll start with you. Oh, I think you're on mute. What I'm looking forward to is finally going home to see my family in San Lucia and just hanging with my mom and listening to some music and just, just looking at, you know, the beautiful Caribbean island. That's what I'm, that's what I'm really looking forward to. So um, I'm counting down the hours and the minutes and the seconds that I can finally do that. But in the meantime, you can find me um, at one of my two restaurants, Buy What American Bistro and Compel a Pen, 
or Instagram. It's just Nina Compton. So thank you for having me and I hope to see you soon. Be safe, everybody. Jackie? Um, I think I'm most looking forward to uh, hopping on a plane anywhere in the world. Um, travel is so important to um, myself and Brant. Um, and I think uh, that's one of the things we've been mourning the most. So travel anywhere, especially Japan. You know, we have such a love affair with Japan through the shop and uh, the, the, the families that make our knives, um, you know, that's that's one of the, the biggest things for us is um, the next trip to Japan, um, but also just a a, a, a show at Tipitina's, you know, uh, simple and as simple as that. I, you know, um, live music is just such it's, it's a void for us all right now. Um, so live music and travel for me. Um, but with that being said, uh, you can find us at uh, cotillianola.com. Uh, we're on Instagram. Uh, it's at cotillianola, C-O-U-T-E-L-I-E-R, NOLA. Um, we are, have a location in New Orleans and Nashville. Um, so, uh, pending no major shutdown, we are open in a little limited capacity, but, uh, feel free to reach out to us if you got any questions or recommendations you need, um, for any type of tool for cooking, heading into the holidays. Um, we want y'all to be safe, uh, be healthy, be happy. Um, there is light on the other side of this guys. We love you. And take us home. Oh, wow. Oh, and you know, uh, I, I'm looking forward to being back in Preservation Hall and uh, have being back with uh, my friends and uh, that's being back in that space again. You know, that those are, that that's a, uh, that's been the hardest uh, piece of all of this is uh, these sacred these sacred spaces that that are so important to all of us, where we many of us haven't been able to go or breathe life into, and being able to breathe life back into those those places and to commune again physically. Oh yeah, um, that's going to be uh, those are going to be that's going to be special when uh when that happens i mean until then it's uh it's getting ready because i do feel the um the floodgates about to open you know and i feel something in energy like pushing through that is is you know it's bursting it's just bursting and i'm really excited about something that i i can't even i it, can't even really imagine i just feel it happening and i do feel something i like this surge uh at this moment and um yeah i can't wait for that moment but ben, until then getting prepared for it then i have to ask i know that we are almost out of time and you can find everything preservation hall just google it when you are back in the hall the pandemic is over it is the first crowd there is just a vibe and energy. What is the first song the band is playing? Ooh. Ah, man. <laughs> oh, Lord. And by is... the way, your, your answer, this is permanent. It's on the record, so no pressure. <laughs> yeah. My gosh, all eyes on me. Oh, my gosh. Oh. That's a hard question. Man. You know what? That's um, I always say this. You know, it's so it's about the people for me, and uh, that's what's most important. Why? What do you want to hear us play? No, no, you are you are the patron son of New Orleans, at the heart of the place that has preserved the heritage music and roots music. You are setting a new era where we get to. Come back what is the song do you know the song that charlie gabriel always sings he sang it to his wife uh it was a conversation that he had with her on the telephone and as soon as they got off the phone he went and wrote the words down and then he called me up and he said listen to this conversation it sounds like a song and we turned it into a song and it's called come with me to new orleans mm. and it is a love song to this city and and 
that would be the song that I would want to play first is uh, this love poem to New Orleans uh, because the words from that song are what convinced his wife, his current wife, to move from Detroit and put down new roots in New Orleans. There you go. Yes. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you once again to Faden, our true partners in this whole project. Thank you all for joining us on TAR. Thank you to our guests. Uh, we'll see you around. Have a good evening.